Eric Sprott, Rick Rule, and Keith Newmeyer are three successful resource investors coming together for one simple reason, to buy cheap assets from distressed companies and seize this once in a decade opportunity to buy gold, silver, and other mineral projects for pennies on the dollar. First Mining Finance Corp, trading on the TSX Venture under FF, a recently launched venture with the sole purpose to acquire advanced stage natural resource projects and starting on day one with 18 projects, management has already identified over 60 additional projects to acquire. Learn more about First Mining Finance at Future Money Trends slash Invest Right. Greetings and thank you for joining us at futuremoneytrends.com. I have an important show for you today. In fact, our guest today uh, is here to probably address one of the biggest holes in the financial advisory service. Now, he's not a financial advisor, but he is a consultant to companies like these and individual investors. Uh, we're looking at people who are entering their 50s, 60s, and 70s in today's environment where we have unprecedented risk as Americans with an unstable currency market, ballooning deficits and debt. The Fed is involved more in our markets on a daily basis. However, no matter what's going on in the world, because there's always some crisis, um, you have to have a transition, a different mindset uh, when you get in your, your latter years. Um, our guest is Dennis Miller. He is formerly of Casey Research with the letter Miller's Money Forever. He's the author of Retirement Reboot. He's a regular contributor on marketwatch.com where you can find him. And you can also reach out to him on Twitter at DM on the money. That's DM on the money. Dennis, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it, Daniel. Uh, I have to make one thing just to keep all the lawyers happy. And that is I don't do individual investment counseling. I'm not licensed or qualified according to the lawyers to be able to do that. Uh, I have done an awful lot of writing and things on the subject and interviews, even to the point that I talked to some uh, certified financial planners on concepts and ideas. But uh, I don't handle individual accounts. So uh, to keep the lawyers happy, I had to put that in. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, totally expected, uh, you know, in these times. And and I should note that on Market Watch, you're a retire mentor. Uh, with a, It's a special column. So if anybody's looking for Dennis Miller, you can just type in Dennis Miller Market Watch and you'll find a lot of articles. Actually, you've been a contributor of theirs for some time, right? Yes, I have. And oddly enough, Daniel, one of the things that I believe is still true is that I am the only retire mentor who's actually been retired. Hmm. And uh, a lot of times I, you'll find me taking on what I would refer to as the conventional wisdom of some of the financial planners with all their models and that sort of thing. That uh, uh, Some of the conventional wisdom that I see them touting doesn't necessarily match up with what uh, I see from my peers in reality. So uh, I, I just call it the way I see it from my peer group and uh, hopefully some people can learn from it. Well, let's let's start off with the definition of a financially successful retirement. If you could uh, you know, introduce the audience to, because retirement can mean many things to people. Like you said, there is a conventional idea of how it's going to perfectly work out with these, you know, CNN money retirement calculators and Yahoo Finance. What What is your personal definition of a successful retirement? I think that's a good question, Daniel. I said, I, I look at it into two different areas. I think first is having built up enough of a life savings or a nest egg to provide you supplement your social security or other income with enough money uh, to live the comfortable lifestyle that you want to live. Now that doesn't mean you have to live like Donald Trump. The word here is the comfortable lifestyle that you're used to. But then the other side of it is not having to constantly worry about money in the if you're, you're always worrying, you know, I, I, matter of fact, I'll tell you a good story. One of one person wrote in recently said, you know, now that I'm retired, I really don't want to have to get up at two in the morning to check the futures market anymore. <laughs> uh, you're just not quite enjoying the retirement. Uh, I have another friend that was part of his bucket list was to take his entire family on a cruise. And he said, you know, once I went into retirement, I gave up my full-time job. We, we went on the cruise, 
But he said, I don't know if they did this. I didn't enjoy it nearly as much as I thought because I was worried about how much money it costs. So there's just as much on the emotional side as there is the financial side to truly enjoying retirement. Have low yields and the weak economy of the last five years, ha- ha- is this killing um, retirement? I mean, and, and people are also living longer. I mean, are all these calculators and projections even close to accurate in today's environment? I think that there's a real potential for error. Uh, Some are better than others. Um, You know, it was certainly easy to be safe uh, when you had fixed income products paying six, seven, and eight percent. You know, I used to chide my father about being conservative, and he always said, well, the market can go down. Uh, Now I totally get what he was trying to tell me. But the point being that here's here's where I run into the problem uh, or concern, perhaps is a better word. Uh, I had somebody recently talk about changing gears, moving into retirement. And I looked and I thought about it for a minute and I said, I think that's a terrific analogy. But what most people don't understand is the gear you're changing into is reverse. And Dan, let's stop and think about it for a minute. During the build-up period, you are trying to accumulate wealth. And you've all heard the, the term, gee, I'm not trying to get rich anymore. I'm just trying to keep from getting poor. And once you give up your full-time job and your primary source of income, that's not a funny little saying anymore. It's the truth. And those things that you talked about, are making it much more difficult to keep from getting poor, if you will. Now, let me give you a quick example. I have some friends that retired around 2005, and they kept their money in the market. And and you know the theory. These are the big companies of the world. Those businesses are going to be around for 100 years. They pay good dividends. When the market goes down, they're always some of the first to come back. You know, that's the conventional wisdom, which is based on historical fact. Except here's what I see is not factored into the equation. And that is when you sit down with that financial model, you use that financial model to build your nest egg. And then that same financial model says, now, remember the old 4% rule, Daniel, where you take you can take out 4% and the money should last uh, for the rest of your life. Well, I have some friends, sad to say that in 2008, you know, they saw their life savings, their 401k, literally dropped by 40 to 50 percent. Well, wait a minute. It's going to come back. What are you you worried about? Well, they don't have that benefit of time. And what happened was instead of now taking out four to four percent, because it dropped, and I'll use it half to keep the math simple, because it dropped in half, now they're having to take out eight percent because their bills haven't changed. So they're having to take out double the amount of a portfolio half the size. Well, after they did that for a couple of years, then they ran the projections. And the projection says, you're going to run out of money by the time you're 85. Because they never shifted into reverse and focused first on preservation of capital and avoiding the catastrophic losses. Now, it was easier when you had fixed income because you could put a huge portion of your retirement nest egg into fixed income. Fixed income can't keep up with inflation these days. So when you're talking about the models and the changes that were brought about about the Fed, I'm finding an awful lot of people now that used to be able to live off the interest and never touch the principal are now having to run those calculators and saying, I'm having to touch the principal Am I still good to go to 105 or 110 or 120? So that those challenges are very real today. And my concern is, I don't know that the financial models take into consideration the mindset and the situation that the retiree is in. Any retiree who has his financial advisor say, don't worry about it, it always comes back. 
that to me, Daniel, sends up a big, big red flag. He's probably right. The real question is, will it come back before I'm 85? <laughs> It's a great point. Uh, You know, also with with most financial advisors, there is absolutely zero zilch concern about currency risk. How does one factor uh, this in when when they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, or even in their 80s, and they're stuck between the desire to maximize income, but also they also don't want their wealth to vanish overnight because there could be a systemic crisis in the next five to 10 years with the American monetary system? Well, I think that's a really good question. And, you know, I I was reading recently a column about the robo-advisors. And the robo-advisor, the the person that they talked about is in his 30s. And his comment was, if I just keep doing what I'm doing, according to my robo-advisor, when I'm ready to retire, I'll have something like 4.5 million. And that's based on the calculation of historical returns that I will return 9.7% annually on a compound basis. Uh, Wait a minute. Maybe you will, Mm -hmm. but maybe you won't. And to me, I I look at this as similar to the people who have these 529 plans that are trying to put their children through college without ending up with uh, huge college loans. Well, by the time your your child gets to 16, 17, 18 years old, okay, I don't know that I'd be as interested in the 9.7% historical uh, S&P gains or whatever the guy was referring to as much as I would be putting a lockdown on that capital so that the money's there when he graduates at 18. Pity the poor guy who had a 529 plan that was doing really well and graduated from high school in 2008 and all of a sudden his 529 plan dropped in half. Well, take that same analogy You might be doing a great service with the robo-advisor in your 30s, but as you move across your own biological timeline, you better start getting more conservative as you move across and factoring in some things that the computer and the algorithms haven't taken uh, into consideration, like we've never had the Fed intervene with a TARP bill and the QEs before. How is that factored into the algorithms? So I think what you're really getting to, David, is the bottom line is all those things are terrific tools used properly with good judgment. And you cannot take human judgment out of the equation. Uh, It's just the way it is. And you're throwing up some of the issues that every investor, not just retirees, has to deal with. The investing market has changed. It's worldwide now, and it's scary. What what type of investments can you sh- can you share that with us? Do, do you recommend for people in their sixties and seventies? Does it does it include um, landlording? Does it include international stocks? Does it include gold and silver? Does it include um, bonds or or dividend paying stocks? If if you can just shed some light on what what does an allocation kind of look like? I know for each individual, it's going to be di- it could be different. But if you can just kind of give us a general idea. I think you have to start with the mindset. The mindset is you want non-correlated assets or a negative correlated asset. For example, uh, there is no reason why you wouldn't invest in some really good solid companies that we talked about before to pay a good dividend. In any event, the point is it becomes how much of your overall allocation would you put there? And where do you set your mindsets? When do you rebalance? One of my favorite uh, investments was CWB, it it was a bond. Uh, This at the same time now, I believe if you are investing in a single country, a single content uh, continent, or a single currency, you are setting yourself up for the potential for a catastrophic loss so that you're going to have to find international companies. There's good ones out there. Uh, You're going to have to diversify. I personally uh, have bonds denominated in seven different currencies. 
because as you know, currencies are traded in pairs. So if one goes down, I have an offset. The other one goes up. So that I, the catastrophic uh, potential is reduced. So as far as the landlord issue that you deal with, we have some friends that are very wealthy uh, that are in fact in the landlord business. Then it becomes a matter of their time. And most of the people that I know, once they start reaching their 70s, don't that's a job that's a job that they want to get rid of so you have to be looking at looking at that separately so i think diversification is the key in non-correlated assets and offsets so that you're going to reduce the possibility of a catastrophic loss it can be done just takes an awful lot more work than what we've had to historically do in the past what's what about precious metals and and how do you recommend people hold them Oh, I am very much an advocate of precious metals, uh, but you have to make sure, as you said, how do you hold them? Uh, I, I refer to what we call our core holdings, and I look at the core holdings like a fire extinguisher. Uh, you hope you never have to use it, and the core holding says basically, if you think the U.S. dollar is going to collapse, or you think the monetary system is going to collapse, gold historically is the only true money. So I recommend not only core holdings that you would have in physical metals, and you better have some offshore because the U.S. government already has a a history of confiscation. Uh, And then I also have some of the uh, sprout funds because those are truly backed by metal. Uh, They put in a certain amount of metal, they have a certain number of shares, and that's what their fund is. I wouldn't touch GLD or SLV with a 10-foot pole. And the the core holdings are your foundation. Uh, If everything else collapses, it's those core holdings that are going to keep you surviving. And don't make it sound like a gloom and doomer because, you know, people – are finding that every currency in the history of man has eventually collapsed. Uh, I hope I never sell my core holdings. I hope, hope my children inherit them and they never have to sell them. Because when we get to the point where we do, they will be priceless. What about debt in this environment? Um, I mean, it's probably too risky for someone to borrow to 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 invest because there's no there, the the yield is not there. But I mean, as a retiree, what's what's more important, being debt free or having money in your 401k and your, your retirement accounts? I don't think you have I don't think you have a net worth. If you if you if you have a five hundred thousand dollar portfolio and five hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, I think your net worth is still zero. Mm-hmm. Remember, we also talked about the second part of retirement being not have to constantly worry about money. Well, the point being is one of the greatest days of my life was when I paid my house off. Uh, I think that probably uh, my blood pressure probably dropped five to ten points. And everybody that I know of that is debt free there is that emotional side of it that says that makes sense. Now, you know, you've got young people who can sit down and say, well, look, if you can mortgage your house at 3%, you can always make more than that in the market. My answer is, really? Uh, Unless you can sit there and mortgage your house at 3% and show me a 6% federally insured FDIC or a 6% U.S. Treasury bond or something like that, uh, I don't think you can always guarantee it's going to happen, Uh, which basically what you're really talking about is leverage. And the point is, would you advise a retiree to buy any investment on margin? for a retiree in particular who's trying to keep from losing money, uh, I, I really would have a hard time doing that, Danny. Yeah. Uh, in a recent marketwatch.com post, uh, you seem to be strongly suggesting investors take some profits, tighten up their losses, and rebalance. Are, are you starting to see a market top here, Dennis, or was this just prudent advice that needs to be said from time to time? I think I'm feeling a market top, but you know what? My intuition is no better than anybody else's intuition. Uh, You know, I talked about margin debt being an all-time high, and a lot of people are ignoring that, saying, well, that's not really a sign of a market top. Well, 
It is and it isn't. Uh, at the same time, the stock market now has gone, what, approximately 1,300 days since a, a major correction. So the fact remains is that whether it's a market top or not, if you are investing retirement money, make sure you're rebalanced so you're not over allocated. Tighten up your stop losses. Be a little bit conservative because your goal isn't to get every ounce of blood out of the out of the turnip. Your goal as a retiree is to protect your portfolio so that when that top does eventually blow off, whether it's this year or two years from now, uh, you live to fight another day. Uh, there comes a point where I'm looking at the market today and say the additional blood left in the turnip versus the risk of staying all in, uh, we better take a good look at it. So I guess I'm avoiding your question is trying to call the market. But uh, at the same time, I sure I sure have a hard time uh, believing that it's going to continue to go, particularly because it's not based on fundamentals. It's based on the Fed. Dennis. Um, do you do you adv- adv- advise or recommend from your own experience people continue working? Because obviously you retired, but then you you're uh, you're doing something you really enjoy and love. Do you think that is? Do you think the mindset of not just quitting outright, uh, which is currently kind of the conventional idea of retirement, but uh, a mindset of still having something to do, maybe maybe having a side business or a side job, is that is that part of the new retirement? I think you're right. I, I tell friends I flunked retirement the first time. You know, I was asked actually uh, asked to write a newsletter and come out of retirement and write my book. Uh, I did a series of articles on it about two years ago about what we call encore careers. And some of the happiest people wrote in. It was just absolutely amazing. Uh, do you remember the old, you might be too young, the Pet Rock? The, um, uh, I remember hearing about that. Yeah, I do remember. Okay. Well, one lady wrote in and she sent me a copy. She paints rocks to look like pets or whatever. And it kind of been her hobby for years. She had one that was painted like a dog that was a big enough rock that it made a nice doorstop. Hmm. Well, she took a couple of these things to a craft show, and now she's making really good retirement income just painting rocks and having a ball going to all these craft shows. Uh, I had another guy write in that he and his wife were both retired pilots, and he had a little small uh, Piper aircraft. And he was at, uh, you know, the fixed base operator and he was filling his plane up and they got to talking and he was saying, yeah, retirement's kind of boring. He gets offered a job delivering aircraft all over the world that he can pick and choose the ones that he wants. And he said, now, OK, we need an aircraft delivered to the Bahamas. You want to deliver it? He looks at his wife, yeah, we'll go. So they fly the aircraft to the Bahamas. They hang out on the beach for a week or so. Their airfare home is paid back, and they're picking and choosing and loving it. There's also a group of retirees doing this, retirees doing the same thing, delivering motorhomes all over the country, where they tow their family car behind the motorhome, drop the motorhome off at the dealership. Uh, it's all been paid for. Then they take their time coming back and enjoy a vacation. So to me, if you go back and you look at uh, – the book Passages, where Gail she he talks about 80 is what 70 used to be and 70 is what 60 used to be. I am very much in favor of an encore career because if it gives you some fun, it makes you feel like you're doing something, uh, why not? You know, some people ask me about the amount of money that I've made since I've uh, come back into the workforce. I'm not making a lot of money, but I'll tell you what it does. I can take my wife out for dinner every night of the week if I want to and not have to worry about it. Uh, And that's about the extent of the way I'm looking at the money for my retirement career. So for a retiree, sure, why not? Particularly because it takes the pressure off. Now, Dennis, I've been speaking to you off and on this past week. You have a genuine, genuine love and concern for retirees and specifically your subscribers. 
that you had with Miller's Money Forever. Uh, if anyone listening to this was a subscriber or or wants to uh, continue to follow Dennis, I think there's going to be some new things in store in the future. Uh, nothing, uh, I'm assuming nothing, you're not here to announce anything, but if anybody wants to reach out to you, it's at DM on the money. Uh, so DM on the money at Twitter. And uh, believe me, guys, if you're listening to this show and you want somebody who genuinely cares and understands the global economic risk and uncertainty and you're in your 50s and 60s or 70s, reach out to Dennis. Uh, this is a very genuine person who wants to help and understands the unprecedented risk. Um, anything you want to add, Dennis, before we close out? No, I, I appreciate that. And Daniel, I uh, appreciate you also reaching out to me. I've had a lot of people come to me that seem to have enjoyed my point of view and what I write. And I'm trying to figure out exactly to do what you're talking about, how I can still reach out to people and be a retire mentor uh, and do it in a manner that allows me enough free time to enjoy life and still makes me feel like I can contribute. So I appreciate your help in reaching out to me as well, Daniel. Thank you. Well, hey, thanks so much. And I hope at 75 I'm uh, I'm doing the same thing you are right now. So, Dennis, thank you so much for your time. Again, everyone, Dennis Miller, uh, author of Retirement Reboot, regular contributor of Market Watch, and you can find him at Twitter at DM on the money. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you.